Hello everyone, Ned LeBeau again with today's promised talk on classical realism. And classical realism I offer as an interpretivist understanding of realism in sharp contrast to either realpolitik or neorealism. Neorealism we're familiar with from the last uh, talk. It is personified in Kenneth Waltz's theory of international relations that attempts to make it into a positivist science. Realpolitik refers to a tradition uh, first really described in 19th century Germany but widely practiced that argues that all ethics and domestic politics stop at the water's edge. In pursuit of security, states should use any means at their disposal. Uh, somebody like Henry Kissinger is the embodiment of a strategy of realpolitik, uh, perfectly willing to use coups, assassinations, uh, massive bombings, uh, anything at the disposal of his country to advance what he thought were its interests. The tragic understanding of politics that I will talk about today stands in uh, sharp contrast to these uh, views. Uh, if Waltz and neorealism look to science for their guide. Uh, Hans Morgenthau and others who represent the tragic understanding of politics and international relations look to literature. Uh, they see politics as more of an art than a science and literature as a guide to both how it should be understood and practiced. Now, tragedy developed in 5th century before the Common Era Athens in the form of plays that were performed at festivals. Uh, citizens came in large numbers to watch and talk about what they saw afterwards among themselves. Tragedy was a discourse that was used to explore in a remarkably open and sophisticated way the problems that the city of Athens faced, those of its citizens within it, and more broadly, the role of the citizen and the state in the world at large. Uh, it's very hard in the scope of a talk like this to really give uh, any kind of meaningful elaboration of the concept of tragedy. So instead I'll use a shorthand and refer to four kinds of dilemmas that tragedy highlights. Um, the first might be called uh, tragedies of character that catastrophic outcomes happen because people act in character. They build on their strengths, they're overconfident about them, and all the more so when they've been successful in the past. The classic example of this in tragedy is Oedipus, who is both strong and intelligent, as you all know, completely dedicated to avoiding his predicted fate of killing his father and having sex with his mother, and in the process ends up doing exactly what the prophecy suggests. Second uh, kind of tragedy refers to uh, the 
lack of tolerance or overcommitment to one's own values and views of the world. Antigone or the Aristia are plays in which this trope uh, figures centrally. Uh, the Oresteia is a long story of evil and revenge, but what is relevant to us here is the idea that uh, Orestes has killed his mother to avenge his father. He's pursued by the Furies who defend traditional family values, but defended by Athena because he's upholding a different principle of justice by seeking retribution for an evil act. It suggests that you can look at complex situations from different ethical perspectives and that it may not be possible to decide which one should have priority. A third kind of tragedy arises from the need to make hard choices. Do we uh, pursue our political uh, goals, uh, even if it means writing roughshod over the rights and interests of others? Uh, or do we uh, step back and recognize that some degree of compromise is possible. Tragedy rises because people are rarely self-restrained. And finally we have the tragedy of clashing values where People are embedded in a particular understanding of their responsibilities and roles and don't recognize that others are as well. Um, Antigone is committed to family and buries her brother despite the prohibition against it issued by the ruler of Thebes, Creon, because her brother had been a rebel. Creon is committed to public order and willing to pursue it to any degree possible, including punishing Antigone for having buried her brother by walling her up in a tomb outside the town. In the process, he fundamentally destroys his family and brings the city again close to the brink of a civil war. All of these kinds of tragedies find resonance in international relations, um, as I'm sure uh, you have um, already considered. Uh, tragedies of character. Uh, great powers again and again reenact the Greek tragedy based on hubris. Hubris for the Greeks is a category era. It leads people to confuse themselves with the gods. They believe they can predict and control the future the way the gods do. They engage in complicated, far-reaching plans or plots in the expectation of making gain, but in fact produce loss. Consider from early modern Europe to the present, the successor of states, of the, yes, the succession of states who have sought to become hegemons to dominate those around them. Philip of Spain, Louis XIV of France, Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm, Hitler. Each of them started conflicts thinking that they would emerge as victors. In each case, 
their efforts to gain incrementally or gain control over Europe led to their defeat and in some cases their destruction. Uh, there's probably good reason to apply this trope to the United States in the post-Cold War era, uh, acting in ways as in the invasion of Iraq where it thought it would dramatically increase its influence and control over others, uh, but in fact reducing support and respect for it everywhere and setting in motion a process of relative decline. Clashing values. Think about Sunni and Shia within the Muslim world. Escalating violence because of religious differences and unwillingness on the part of one or both sides to accept and live with the choices and practices of the other. Uh, the Cold War, which went from a power struggle to a Manichaean all-out struggle of opposing systems. Fortunately, there was some willingness to compromise. Or today, the rising conflict between China and the United States, uh, which has an important element of this. Failure to make hard choices. Consider at the moment, I'm still in lockdown here in New Hampshire, uh, but my state is beginning gradually to open up, huh? uh, surely in a more responsible way than some of the southern states uh, that have removed almost all controls and allow people to mix in large numbers without masks in public. There's a trade-off here between reducing the spread of infection or improving the economy. Uh, you can't do both at the same time. Leaders, especially the president, have been reluctant to face up to the choice. In the process, they're behaving in ways which are destructive uh, to citizens and uh, one hopes to themselves uh, as well. Tragedy, while an artistic trope, clearly has great relevance to the present, to international relations. I noted that Hans Morgenthau is the great international relations theorist who is embedded in a tragic perspective on life and politics. This is not surprising because as Greek texts made their way from Arabic into English and German and other European languages in the Renaissance. There was a revival of interest uh, from Homer to the tragic uh, playwrights. The Germans in particular were drawn to tragedy for, for many reasons and the tragic perspective became central to German literature and politics from Hölderlin and Schiller on up through Nietzsche and even later in the 20th century to someone like Hannah Arendt. Morgenthau is embedded in this tradition and applies it to politics. He offers a perspective on international politics and realism uh, diametrically opposed to realpolitik and also, of course, uh, equally against what would later emerge as neorealism. Uh, from Morgenthau's perspective, drawing on tragedy, realism teaches us that the real threats to great powers are not other great powers, but themselves. It is their failure to exercise self-restraint, their hubris, that leads them to believe that they are so powerful and so successful that they can impose their preferences on others, pursue their interests in ways that don't take into account the needs and self-esteem of others, and by doing so, undermine, if not destroy, their leading position. 
the United States, if we take it as an example, uh, has of course been in the process uh, of doing this. Uh, consider the uh, Iraq War as a classic example of somebody, or a state in this case, uh, acting in ways where it thought it was so powerful and by having a campaign of shock and awe would reduce others to either clients, make them more cautious, uh, prevent proliferation in Iran and North Korea, and lock in American hegemony. Huh? Hubris led to exactly the kind of outcome that Sophocles describes in Oedipus. The reverse of what he or the United States intended to do. The U.S. lost influence by invading Iraq. It created strong incentives and the opportunity for Iran and North Korea to proliferate. It made the U.S less respected by its closest allies. Uh, BBC World Opinion poll in the years afterwards, and it continues today, indicate that people in countries like France, Germany, Britain, Japan, Australia, consider the United States one of the greatest threats to the peace of the world, um, along with countries like North Korea. Uh, consider the Middle East, uh, rather than making the U.S. the arbiter of politics in that region, it set in motion a chain of unforeseeable and perhaps unpredictable actions that undermined U.S. and Western influence, led to terrorism, and more recently to ISIS and untold human tragedy. Um, Morgenthau would argue that tragedy is a form of ethics, that ethics is defined as living up and conforming to the commonly accepted values of your community. This is both a domestic community and a regional and international one. That by violating them, because you're so powerful, thinking that you will gain more, you in fact lose. That self-restraint must be exercised by ethical leaders, but also by leaders who are restrained by public opinion and committed to upholding the domestic values of their country. They have to make hard choices, not pretend they can have their cake and eat it too, yet another form of tragedy. And consider, again using the example of the United States, how for the whole period of the Cold War the U.S. was willing to support, uh, and go to bed with you might even say, right-wing dictators around the world, thinking that they were helpful in opposing its principal adversary, the Soviet Union. Two things happened as a result. When these dictators were overthrown, as in Iran, these countries became primary adversaries of the United States. And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, in its conflict with the Soviet Union, the U.S. sought to uphold its values and system, but increasingly copied the Soviet Union in how it behaved abroad, and even at home in some cases, and ended up uh, more like its adversary. Uh, in pursuit of the very goal it sought, it undermined the values that made that goal worth upholding. So, classical realism, which I've given just the uh, 
broadest overview of today, offers a very different perspective on politics. An interpretivist one, embedded in literature, embedded in ethics, and certainly, going back again to the Greeks, offers phronesis uh, as its goal, a, a way of formulating appropriate values and pursuing them intelligently. Thank you very much.